Welcome to today's episode of Becoming a Post-Growth Planner, Obstacles and Challenges to Changing Roles and Practices. I'm Christian Lamka, Assistant Professor for Sustainable Transformation and Regional Planning at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And today I have a special guest and I'm really honored to welcome Karl Kremer uh, speaking to us from Turin, Italy today. And Karl, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Of course, thank you very much for this uh, invitation. I'm, I'm very glad about it. And um, well, I am a PhD researcher here at the Politecnico di Torino, and I it's quite some years that I work about uh, the growth space cities planning um, in an academic context, but I'm also at the same time a degrowth activist in the Italian uh, degrowth movement. Yeah, you wrote a recent paper in European Planning Studies, Are Green Cities Sustainable? A Degrowth Critique of Sustainable Urban Development in Copenhagen. What would you say, what did you find out? What is the typical planning that happened there in Copenhagen that you also position as a critical case? Yeah, so I think it's a critical case because um, Copenhagen, of course, is very often cited as a virtuous example of a, of a green city. You know, it has, has gotten several awards. It is uh, cited also uh, in, in many papers as best practice and so on. And the point is that um, on one side, certainly at a technical planning level, uh, Copenhagen and other green cities uh, are doing very interesting stuff in the sense uh, for example, uh, building bike lanes and uh, doing strong um, policies for uh, for bicycles for changing mobility um, and public transport and and, and, and other things. Uh, the problem is that um, this, in such context, it never becomes systemic change. Uh, it is it is coherent uh, with uh, the general perspective of sustainable development and green growth, which basically says from the growth perspective that, um, well, basically you can go on like we have done like we have done before. Now we can we can produce and consume. It's no problem. We just have to do it in a slightly different way. But finally, we can continue to grow, we can continue to build things. They just must be green. But it is never considered really uh, that there are often contradictions between these aims. Um, and so what happens in, in Copenhagen and I think in many other places that uh, in the first place impacts are externalized. So, well, you may reduce uh, the, the carbon emissions produced locally, but then you import stuff, goods, services from outside. And finally, uh, the lifestyle doesn't change and it is uh, and it still remains with very high impact on the environment and also on social issues. So as a spatial planner, a local spatial policy maker, why is it so important? You say to under, understand these dimensions. So, because Copenhagen is European green capital, all the sustainable policies. So, in some way, it's a model city for how to develop policies today and how to do green policies. So, why is your view so important to entangle what's behind this? Yeah, I think well, it has also very much to do with uh, how you conceive space. No? And I, I'm, I'm very fascinated in this period, and I think it's, it's very very important to look at space as relational. Um, for example, take Dorian Massey's contribution on this, um, that, that space is made of relations, that places are um, crossroads of relations, that's where relations meet. So um, it is very hard to um, like govern certain dynamics uh, looking only inside the boundaries. Uh, and I think this is basically nothing really, very, very new in a, in a, um, in debates on space, on cities and so on. Um, but it still is very little considered uh, when we talk about 
uh, green cities, about sustainability in cities, which very much focuses on the local. And interestingly, it does so, I would say, both in, 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 in sustainable development oriented practices and in degrowth discourses. Both tend to focus very much on the local. Um, I just in this example of Copenhagen, for example, what is interesting that speaking about economy and economic economic development, there's very much the idea of collaboration outside and looking at the position of Copenhagen in relation to other places. When it is about uh, sustain ecological sustainability, the look is totally inside. It's just about how people move around inside the city, how much carbon is emitted inside the city. But there's now consideration about um, uh, the impacts all uh, the relations uh, outside um, of Copenhagen have. Um, and do you have an idea this, why this why this happened? Uh, why this happened? So is the term sustainability not sufficient, not a good one to use, or uh, what makes these strategies then shifting so much towards a local focus, but in the global competitive landscape? Um, I think uh, th th it is so because if you take into consideration all these relations and and what happens outside um, the the all the building of uh, all the construction of sustainable development really crumbles. Um, there has been uh, th this this recent report well, two years ago, I think it came out, decoupling debunked, uh, which uh, very um, strongly shows, shows that the idea of decoupling so that you can continue to grow economically while reducing economic impacts is not feasible for many theoretical reasons and, and also proved in many empirical studies. And one central point of this is the point about externalization. Um, so what has happened in, um, in the improvement of urban environments in Europe in the last uh, decades um, is mostly that impacts have been externalized. They have been moved to China, for example, where production now happens. Now, of course, our cities are uh, in have better ecological quality locally today than 50 years ago because you don't have the emissions of all this industry anymore but it's just moved some somewhere else um, and we still consume those things so uh, if you take this into consideration you really see that uh, unlimited growth can't be sustainable so if you take it into consideration seriously i think um you, you must challenge growth as an idea in urban policies and but growth is still remaining the main goal of policies in in europe and i would say most all, all the world so i think this is why uh, this is one reason why 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 policies ecological policies are so locally focused yeah so imagine again now we are back at local policy do you have alternatives in mind? What would you offer or what would you advise maybe to, to integrate and to, to start thinking differently and to take into account these global perspective, the way how we ex externalize effects? Yes, I've, of course, this is a hard task. And I think that probably at the level of urban ecological policies, uh, social policies, this is something new. Uh, but I think we have to start to think about it. Um, there, in, in, in a recent German book on the post-growth city, post Wachstumstadt, there are two contributions by Ulrich Brand and Frank Eckert, which uh, positioned the slogan, which I think very consider very interesting, of the solidarity growth city. So a city that politicizes uh, politicizes its material relations on which uh, the wealth of its, its inhabitants. Uh, are built. Now, of course, we are speaking here about cities in the global north in the first place. Um, and so um, I think that uh, at least a starting point, necessary starting point would be that in planning for uh, sustainable cities, uh, we need to consider in the first place statistics, numbers, which are based on consumption-based impact, so that which, which take into consideration all the impacts included in our local consumption and not only what we produce locally. And, um, 
and, and I think this is the first thing and then uh, perhaps and then you can debate if all of this is needs to be at the local level um, that you should also more in detail this is what I'm working about in my PhD research uh, look at how relations with distant places work and uh, how they are problematic in social and ecological terms and how they should improve I think this is something Right. Perhaps, I don't know, at least in my perspective at the moment, it's, it's hard to define specific policies uh, on this latter point, but I think it's important. What would you say on, does this mean for the role of planners then? Because oftentimes planning is then also sure. a way to creatively find solutions, to find consensus in, in a local setting or even yeah. also the regional setting. Um, aren't planners then maybe the bad guys pointing towards, okay, you want to do that, but take into account uh, relational dimensions and externalities in other places? Yeah, of course. It's it's uh, they should in the sense that would you need would you would need a rethinking of of the rule. But well, I I think there is one thing which you could already say quite clearly, which you can already say quite clearly, which uh, and and I would say. That this externalization has a much has very much to do in global north city with consumption. So um, I think uh, you should work about reducing consumption. Uh, I think this is a central degrowth issue together with reducing production, of course, which is the same, which is the other side of the same coin. So planning, what could planning do? Uh, you could avoid building new shopping malls, you could uh, avoid um you, in, on the other side you, you could start to um focus on creating spaces where you can live well uh without consuming you know, without uh consuming matter and energy or reducing very little of it uh of course avoiding to build further stuff uh but rather uh, thinking about how you could maybe uh, unbuild uh, unused parts of city and restitute them to to natural spaces and to communal spaces would be uh, important points. So um, I think that even considering lo global relations, there are many things which you can do locally as a consequence. From your experience, now you did research in Copenhagen, uh, you are German, you're now based in Italy. Do you experience differences or is it all similar or what does it also help us to look maybe in different contexts, different nations, the very different cities? Um, well, I, I wouldn't say that I'm an expert of all European planning systems. <laughs> I, I have had to do in my personal Certainly, differences in in focuses. I mean, of course, Copenhagen is an is an example when you think about cycle mobility, for example, and it is great. Of course, Italian cities have much more problems with North, the northern cities with um, uh, with good public transport, for example, which is uh, which is not really the case here, unfortunately. Um, a positive thing, perhaps in Italy, is that is the strong role of urban agriculture. Not so much as a planned thing, but uh, as as a tradition that persists. What I, what I what I found find very really interesting that if you walk around here, like in every potential possible space, there is an orchard. There is someone growing vegetables in the garden outside the garden, legally, legally. Um, while uh, some weeks ago, back in Munich, where I come from, I, I walked around like for three hours between gardens that I didn't see it was like a single tomato plant. Um, but then I think that the general tendency is quite common. Uh, there's this priority of growth uh, as, a, as a political dimension. And on the other side, of course, you have a lot of button up bottom-up initiatives which try to create alternatives but uh, and 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 instead on the political institutional level you remain at very sectoral changes and uh, there's no real systemic changes in, in sight so far but you remind us that many people are quite open to certain ideas at least cycling in copenhagen maybe growing food locally urban gardening in italy 
So no matter in where you go, you find certain aspects of it, you draw certain aspects of alternatives that are there. So from this, do you have an advice for planners, policy makers today to take the courage to then go beyond this single example yeah. to foster more of that, to in include more of degrowth thinking then also to other domains? Certainly. So I think that degrowth really is systemic change. So I don't think that a single planner can make degrowth planning. Uh, so I, I think that, that that would be too much responsibility because, of course, all the institutional dynamic goes against it. Um, but certainly, uh, I think, think what you what what is important to do is to talk about it, to politicize these things, uh, and to initiate and, and build real alternatives at different scales and on all kinds of of topics. Um, which goes from mobility to uh, like uh, spatial justice to urban agriculture uh, and so on. And together, like trying to build an alternative that becomes ever more desirable. Because I think many pieces of this are actually perceived as, as desirable already. Uh, then the problem is that often things become co-opted by capitalist uh, dynamics, of course, and urban agriculture becomes the next, the urban orchard becomes the next frontier of gentrification or, or such things. Um, but uh, we, we need to go on with this and uh, I, I don't think there's an easy answer, but uh, all these things together can contribute to uh, the cultural change, which I think is necessary to make political systemic change possible. Um, only if an alternative is conceived as necessary and desirable, I think that systemic change will be possible. Perhaps I, in moments of... I yeah, I understand your words also that this cannot be done in harmony. So in sense of if you focus on more cycling, you might get in struggle with parking cars. If you want to do more urban gardening, exactly. you also need a bit of space for that. Uh, that's then not available for other uses. Uh, yes. So is the reality then also that we have very important, nice, helpful quality quality of life ways to go, but on the same time, at the same time, also these hard decisions that are part of that. Certainly, I, I think degrowth is about reducing production and consumption, but imagining a, a differently good life in, in with social equity. So, uh, of course, choices must be made. Uh, you can't just improve cycling, but at the same time want uh, to uh, don't hurt uh, anybody, don't hurt uh, um, cars uh, and car mobility. You must hurt car mobility, you must reduce it. Um, I, th I think that there's no there's no way around it. Um, so um, of and of course this is politically hard and this is the this is the difficulty. It's you can't it can't just be parallel. It must be alternative. Um, so I think there must be spaces of dialogue. There must be um, like to show that. Uh, can be better to talk about it, um, trying not to impose too much, but at the same time, um, don't be afraid of critical reactions uh, in the first place. So you think yeah. there must also be courage. Yeah, I feel that especially because there are such limits, all these global relations that are there and that are imposed upon what we can do. But especially because of that, there is so much need for creative solutions and also so many ways to develop a nice nice environment and nice uh, cities and rural settings for, for all of us. So from my view, it's also especially this what makes planning important and planning meaningful uh, to develop within this corridor, not to avoid change, but still to, to do it within uh, with acknowledging all these relations that are there and the negative impacts that we have. Um, so, if you had a few, just one, two um, ideas, what should a planner keep in mind from your research? Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, try to think systemically. Um, don't look only at the single sectoral aspect because uh, very easily it will end up with uh, improving one side and, and, and making worse on another. 
um, try to think about uh, what impacts it has uh, elsewhere, what you locally do, uh, and consider them uh, and make choices. Mm make choices don't don't believe that um, being sustainable and uh, producing growth can be compatible thank you and i would say most likely also talk to other planners maybe talk to other planners in other cities as well uh, about uh, their view about then the good niches the good experiences in parts of the policies that are made elsewhere so that could also help also trying to help to create and protect spaces where people live together can live together without without consumption without being based on on market relations for example okay so let's to slowly come to an end so before we finish i would like to ask you to complete one sentence for us and that is the sentence post growth planning is post growth planning is planning that takes limits into consideration uh, social justice and environmental sustainability at all scales, also beyond the local, and plans for places where good life without having much is possible. Many thanks, Karl Kremer, for being with us today. Your paper uh, on Copenhagen is out in European Planning Studies, and I'm sure many of our listeners will also follow your research in the upcoming years. And we're also looking forward to your uh, insights into uh, Chilean food production that you're currently working on. So that will also be nice to see all these global relations and also to keep our perspective global, globally connected. So I hope something, something good will come out. Thank you very much. Thank you.